Our goal today is to save you time, energy, and stress while improving the services you deliver. We're going to share ways to increase income while reducing prices. The guiding principle is conservation of energy and effort to get the biggest possible bang for the smallest buck. In an ideal world, each document would require only a single question and answer. But until we reach that ideal, we should strive for an absolute minimum number of questions. And we should ask those questions in a way that can't be misunderstood. Don't be cryptic. Electrons are cheap. Ask questions so that anyone could step into your office and answer them. Make use of the form tool's most powerful features. In my mind, they're smart answers, all the list items, and derived answers. The form tool is built to provide you and your colleagues with a seamless hierarchy of capabilities. Think of it as document IQ. At its most base level, which probably 80% of our customers use almost exclusively, the form tool is just the world's fastest typist. Put a client's name in the question and answer table and watch it replicate throughout the document. It's cool. Fast and accurate have much to recommend them. Really fast and really accurate is really good. Moving up a step in the IQ step ladder is binary logic, where the form tool will add or delete text or other information based on a very simple decision. If the sale or the service or the promissory note or mortgage comes with a guarantee, add the appropriate guarantee language. If not, leave it out. Simple, yes, no. Again, cool. Fast and accurate, nice to have. But let's move up to interesting land where the form tool really starts hitting its stride. Its interactive capability comes into play when you design it as a form author, when you design it to ask the future user questions based on changing circumstances. I'll show you an example of this in just a moment. Where the form tool really shines though, and what much of this is going to be about is when you ask it to reason its way through a problem. I don't mean to overstate this. The form tool doesn't actually think, at least not in version 2.x. It isn't into self-actualization and self-awareness, but you, the author of a document, can teach it to reason through an issue exactly, exactly as you would if you were handcrafting the document from scratch. Now this is magic. Every person on this, on this webinar has the power to replicate his or her own style and level of ex expert decisioning, bringing to bear their own years or decades of experience. The ability to imbue a document to saturate with skill, enough skill to tackle a very high percentage of all the issues it will ever face, or very importantly, to call for help when faced with an issue it doesn't know how to answer. As an author, you can leverage your skills, spread them around your organization. You can knock the error rate into the basement, speed processes, serve more clients or customers faster and better, and make more money with less risk. That's way past cool and, and I think approaching insanely great. Let me show you a, a 25 cent example of doing more with less. This is simple, but it illustrates the point. Our goal is to produce, in this example, is to produce three syntactically correct and completely accurate statements of fact. We can do it the old laborious, time consuming and error prone way, hunt and peck, assisted by cut and paste, or in an improved but still constrained manner, we can do it as shown in the first table, a fairly lengthy sequence of the form tool questions. Best though, is the second table. Here we're down to two questions. This is fast, it's easy, and less error prone. 
In the first table, the form tool is merely a fast typist. In the second, we're beginning to make the form tool work for its living. It's asked the future user a follow-up question. Given that there are children, what are their names, and when was each born? With just those two questions, it can compute their ages, number their gender, determine minority or majority, compute years of child support, and decide on its own whether or not to include the sentence on boys and what it should say. And the form tool can hit that target perfectly 1,000 times out of 1,000. You can hire an incredibly fast typist and an extraordinarily smart one, or perhaps that's you, but you can't hire one who can hit perfection 1,000 times out of 1,000. They don't exist. So I wish I could show you uh, the form on this one, but we just couldn't get permission fast enough. So let me, let me tell you the short story. This client used to spend a couple of days pricing and specking the knocks they build and operate for others. These folks engineered their client development form with the form tool, and in doing so discovered that answers to just 13 questions generated all the information they needed in order to price quote the deal, spec the equipment and, and square footage, develop the work order, and write the contract. It also cut the process down from two days to just a few hours. Sort of like the credit card commercial, it's, it's, uh, it's priceless. Now let's get into some examples you can take to the bank. I'm going to concentrate on four of the form tools most powerful features and functions, and one of its most important. Then we'll take a look at some pretty interesting computations. The four that I think are particularly important are master lists, conditional paragraphs, derived answers, and the save load command. The important one is to use templates all of the time. Here is a real life example. And out of this example, although it's based in the law, law area, um, our commercial clients can, can learn a lot as well. These are a set of three documents, um, all together about 5,000 words, um, 20,000 keystrokes or so. And the legacy practice is to go through this document and find the areas that need to be changed and then hand type in those changes. And there are, in these three documents, 388 variables that need to be changed for every use. Almost 4,000 keystrokes, typically. The attorney, the paralegal, goes through it, changes the names, changes the dates, changes the code numbers. Um, again, hundreds of changes, literally hundreds of changes through the whole thing. It's, it's laborious and it's, uh, it's, it's uh, error prone, uh, hitting a 50% error rate typically for every set of documents. Takes, uh, takes hours to complete, takes hours then to proof, to make sure the details are correct, and, um, and then back in for corrections. All of this very, very time sensitive. So let's take a look at a couple areas that I think are really, really interesting. A number of foreclosures will include a uh, requirement uh, or notice that uh, taxes have been paid. And these are both going to be date sensitive. They're going to have dates within them. They're going to have dollar amounts in text and dollar amounts in figures as well. Ideally, we'd want a system that includes just the accurate information, obviously. But if there is no accurate, if, if there is no information, then take the whole section out. If there are no uh, uh, real estate taxes past due, then do we, need the, do we need the section? On the other hand, we need it to um, expand and contract in accordance with, with reality. Down below that, we have a need to show the past due payments. And we have a need uh, by statute to include them both in text and in numbers. 
And again, we need the ability to expand and contract this based on the number of past due amounts. At the tail end of the same paragraph, there's a requirement to total the contents of the paragraph. Immediately after that, we need this, essentially the same information uh, presented uh, in uh, tabular form, again, tied to dates. Pick up additional information, details. Another paragraph with text and dollars, again, more computations. And down here at the bottom, we have the most, probably the most significant text in the entire uh, document, and that is its date. And this date sets a trigger for not only this document, but for much that happens afterwards. So let's take a look at the second document, the notice of foreclosure. And here there's repetitive information or similar, similar information that needs to be stacked up and then manipulated. We have, however, forward-looking information as well, as well that needs to be uh, computed and the computation process is, is very interesting. And let's go down to the bottom of this document really quickly. We'll see that this document is being uh, created on the 12th day of June. And it has a need then to look forward uh, three months plus and determine what date that is to set that date. It has an, a requirement to subtract 11 days to determine uh, a reinstatement, a final reinstatement day, a requirement then to show the figures that will apply on that future reinstatement day, a requirement to show all that in text again, and then finally, The notice itself, which has a similar, has the same uh, a trigger date. It's going out on the uh, on the 12th of the month. Let's see if I've got that highlighted. I don't have it highlighted, but you can see it here. And within it has all kinds of needs for variable information. Again, all of which has to be correct, and some of it is computed. Again, a date computation with dollars tied to it. Some of it is just straightforward math. Here is probably one of the most interesting uh, computations I've seen recently. We had a need to go out to the future date, which is October 10th. We then had a requirement to name the dates stringing back between June and October, name them in sequence, tie a dollar amount to each one of them, sum that dollar amount. And then largely repeat that process, looking again, naming the dates, tying the, uh, the late charges for each uh, individually, and then summing that. We had a requirement to string out the, uh, the dates of the past due tax payments in text. And let me show you one other thing that I thought was actually kind of fun. Let's see if it's uh, here. Yes. One of the uh, suggestions that we made was to tie the uh, the court jurisdiction to a ma uh, to build the court jurisdiction in master list, and then for each court juris jurisdiction, build in the location, the physical location of the sale, so that by just noting the property's county of record uh, in the property description, that triggers in all of the county specific foreclosure sale information. Kind of cool. When we look at those three documents, on the left is the first one, in the middle is the second, and on the right is the third, you can see that we've built in, we've highlighted in each of these documents the the IQ, I guess I would call it, the document IQ of um, the information that the form tool needed to either replicate or compute and what form of 
of uh, higher level intelligence it took it takes to do these. In the first form, you see the uh, the stuff that is in gray up in the uh, up in the first page. I'm putting the cursor on it now. The gray is merely replicative. It is it's taking uh, answers from the uh, from the Q&A table and putting it into the proper location in the document. What's a little bit interesting here, this is the uh, property tax section that we looked at earlier. What's a little bit interesting here is the need to accommodate the no property taxes, one, one payment past due, three payments past due, an unknown number of payments past due. And so we built this as conditional text, um, creating uh, a variable length uh, set of, of, uh, of details supporting those past due, past due statements, past due taxes. A little bit higher up, using the yellow, you can see the, uh, the uh, linked list information, which is largely binary. Um, we tied a lot of this into uh, the date or the name of the attorney, and then, uh, and then built from, from those to build out the, uh, the firm, the successor trustee, and, uh, and, and all that sort of stuff. The red is the uh, highly complex uh, math and date computations. And you can see as we move through these documents, what was interesting to us is the proportions of the type of information required changes. And you can see as time goes by, these three documents moving from the left, the default notice to the foreclosure notice to the notice of trustee sale, they become not only are they, are they uh, uh, lengthier, but also become uh, more complex. And, uh, and that, is really of interest to us in terms of future development of the uh, of the tool. So, put these guys away, and we'll take the last one, the notice of the trustee's sale. I like to store documents in blank. For me, they're easier to read um, and easier to analyze how much information is required. Scott goes the other direction. Scott likes to see the uh, the field codes in, instead. You've got a choice with the form tool as to what, what shows up when the document's at rest. But here, here is a document with the Q&A table at the, at the uh, tail end. And we're going to go into this Q&A table now, and I'm going to blow this up so we can see it. And we'll see that this document, which is almost 2,000 words, has a Q&A table that has no answers in it. In the real world, somebody would then have to sit down and dig up the answers from prior documents, presumably, and start filling this filling this out. In the form tool world, that is just a couple of clicks to find the client file. And before I click go, I'm going to move this out of the way because it's really kind of fun to watch this one. And now, in about 15 seconds, the form tool will answer all of the questions that it needs answers to for this document, including the variable answers. There you see the, the uh, what period were the taxes passed due for. And we'll come back to that in just a second. So it's done about 14 seconds. You'll see here that in the delinquent period area, we used uh, checkbox choices. Um, the form tool author would go in here once a year, or once every couple of years and update this list. But having clicked, having checked that, it then comes back and asks the form user, okay, for the first half of 2011, where you said the taxes were passed due, how much were those taxes? Same for uh, the back half of 2011 and 2012. If a section is not clicked in the first question, then it's not going to ask the form user to follow up and put in a dollar amount. If there is a guarantee, guarantor, it includes the guarantor language. If there's no guarantor, it doesn't include the guarantee language. And then down at the bottom, I'd like to show you, I'm going to command up in the row section that it unhide 
the derived answers. And here are the rows that I'm using as a form author, or the form author is using, to do the behind the scenes calculations that are intermediary to the final result. These are the calculations that no one needs to, uh, to see or to know about uh, to make the, uh, the document work. But we need a, a container, we need a place to, to put essentially subtotals maybe is a good way of, of looking at it. Uh, so we buried them in the, in the derived answers, which again, the user typically won't see. So it took us 14 seconds to come up with the answers. It'll take the form tool 35 seconds to do all the math and all the logic that the answers require. And having spent that 35 seconds thinking through those answers, it will then turn around and for about 30 seconds longer, uh, write the document itself. We believe that a professional or a executive's time is best spent creating wealth, creating value, uh, not proofing and editing. And so we've designed the form tool, Scott has designed the form tool, so that the proofing and editing is human friendly, rather than having to go on an Easter egg hunt through the document, trying to find out where the changes are, where the changes should have been, and what they should have been. With the form tool, as you know, you merely look through the Q&A table, and if the answers in the Q&A table are correct, then they're correct through the entire document. And as I mentioned, this particular document has 388 changes per use. It is a lot easier for a person to proof 41 items in the Q&A table, decide if the spelling is correct, if the property description is correct, if the filing numbers are correct. If they're correct in the Q&A table, they're correct throughout the entire document. So here we have in less than a minute and a half, a completed 2000 word document with 140 individual ch changes in it, 45 of which are dollar changes, 20 of which are date changes, and 30 of which are dollar changes driven by date changes. So with that done, one step left, is to petrify it and it's ready to go out the door. This is a way that our, uh, our example attorney here, uh, Mick Holler, the, uh, the Lincoln lawyer, can spread his expertise through his office. Um, anybody in his office could complete this form and have complete confidence that it's been done correctly and done exactly as Mr. Haller would have wanted to do it had he done it from scratch uh, by himself. Have you ever wished that you could clone yourself, just spread your, your experience, your judgment, your expertise, your way of doing things to everyone in your office, uh, available on demand, but where you could be confident that it would be done your way? Well, this is your chance. You use the form tool to automate all the complex, time-consuming aspects of pushing information out the door. Use the time saved to do more, to do less, or build or build market share. This is the uh, customer experience I mentioned earlier. Uh, our own experience with a uh, with a uh, um, uh, securities uh, a term sheet. Term sheet 3,700 words um, was delivered back to us in in one tenth the time that we'd normally expect at at one sixth the cost and with zero errors, zero errors. I have a friend who's doing an acquisition of a, uh, of a company and using a boutique uh, law firm to accomplish that. And by his count, and he's a very precise guy and he's also, I believe on, on, this, uh, on this webinar, um, by his count, he counted 20 
material errors in the documents, in his lawyer's documents. Um, when he brought it back to the to the lawyers, they, they said, well, those are those are just typos. Well, okay, fine and dandy, they're just typos, but but what do you think my friend's estimation of the law firm, what do you think happened to that estimation at the law firm with the errors and the explanation? It's critically important for all of us in commerce and, and in law to do it right the first time. It's cheaper, faster, simpler, easier, uh, drives customer satisfaction right through the roof. Um, and the form tool can achieve that result a thousand times out of a thousand. Let's take a look at the real estate uh, foreclosure forms in, in a little more detail, the economics of, of, those, uh, of those. Three documents together, 5,400 words. 383, I, I said earlier 388, 383 changes for each use. And those require at least 4,000 keystrokes. I view those 4,000 keystrokes, every single one of them, as an nothing more than an opportunity for error and errors that are really hard to dig out to find that they're there because so many of them are not textual they're not contextual they they uh, they uh, they don't rely on the words and symbols around them for their uh, for their meaning and that makes it very difficult for us to to pick those kinds of errors up out of those documents so as a consequence the actual experience is a greater than 50 percent error rate the forms themselves are, are miles away from being user friendly. They almost they almost beg uh, beg for errors, uh, hunting and pecking to find out where the variables change, and then cutting and pasting to fill them in. So, the current approach for for 91 or 92 percent of the of the market uh, is entirely manual. It's the hunt and peck to find the variables that need changing, cutting and pasting where possible to replace them. For the numbers, the uh, the tools used are 10 keys on the desktop or Excel or paper and pencil. The number one tool for doing the date computations is counting on fingers. Market value of the documents is about $2,500. It varies substantially, of course, but $2,500 is the uh, is the, the number that we we see. Uh, the transactional value to the client is about $200,000 to, to get the foreclosure, foreclosure completed. Legacy costs, typical, uh, four hours of paralegal time, 100 bucks an hour. Two hours of lawyer time, uh, proofing, uh, fly specking the document uh, several times. Again, that given that 50% error rate, the documents are going to go around maybe three times, maybe four times to get them right. Total investment, six hours, $1,000. TFT model, these documents can be completed uh, in half an hour of paralegal time. They can be proofed and edited in half an hour of lawyer time. Total investment of both one hour, uh, less than $200. For people who, who want to push back and say, geez, you can't possibly do the same job in an hour. Yes, you can. If you get rid of the need to, to hunt and peck through the document, finding the things that need to be changed, missing some of them, you can do it if you don't have to do the math and date computations. If you, those, those date computations don't have to be then confirmed by somebody else. If you don't have to do data reentry, if the review time is slashed, and in, case, in this case, we, we've actually overstated the amount of time it, it's required for the lawyer to go through and proof this thing. We say half an hour. It's, it's, it's quite a bit less than that, actually, because all the data necessary for review is in one place, organized for the human eye, and it's cut from nearly 400 data points to check to just 41 organized into seven coherent groups. So saving time is good. Avoiding errors is good. Now let's quantify the effect of that. Here we have two comparisons. On the left column, we've got a price of $2,500 out to the client. We've got labor that I'm using here as a substitute for opportunity cost of $1,000, which leaves what I term premium earnings to the lawyer of $1,500. 
this is a flat fee project that's priced above the lawyer's hourly rate. And that that excess above the lawyer's hourly rate, $1,500, we term premium earnings. We divide it then by the two hours the lawyer invested in this project and have then credited the, credited the lawyer with $750 an hour of premium premium earnings. These are good numbers. No, no, no getting around. These are, these are nice numbers for the, uh, for the lawyer. But let's take a look at the right-hand column now using the form tool. And let's build into this, just as a starting point, let's build into this a 20% price reduction to the client. And imagine for the moment what effect on the market a 20% price reduction would have to clients. I know what, what uh, effect our securities uh, costs have had on my way of thinking of things. Go out to, uh, to a client that's doing a, a bank client that's doing uh, eight or 10 of these a month. And that's going to be, uh, that's going to be significant. The embedded costs on the form tool side, instead of a thousand dollars, it's $200. Premium earning then goes up from $1,500 to $1,800, even after a $500 reduction in price. But here's where it gets really interesting. Not only does a lawyer make more money because the costs have gone down, but that money now is a return on 30 minutes of lawyer time rather than two hours of lawyer time. So as premium earnings per hour invested have gone from 750, which is a good number, to 3600, which is a really good number. That can either, and that number, since all the costs of the firm are already embedded in the labor costs and the lawyer's fee of $300 an hour, that already captures the receptionist and the telephones and the copying machine and the rent and everything else. So those costs are covered. The $3,600 premium earnings rate per hour then flows can flow to the lawyer and to the equity owners of the uh, of the firm, and that is significant. That time can be then better spent on other clients doing more of this work and realizing all those dollars, or on uh, our building market share. Very very powerful. And this is a this is a potential paradigm uh, change for uh, for the law industry. So, so those are the benefits that intelligent automation brings to the table. A better product with a potential for lower prices and higher earnings. So in summary, practice elegance of energy and motion. Use the form tool to make your work as simple and easy as possible. Save your energy for the big challenges, for the challenges that need human intervention. Think user first. Imagine the ultimate user on your document is someone you've never met. Design for that person, not for yourself. And the result then will be an incredibly good document, a good document for you to use if you're going to be the user as well as the author. It would be a great document for you to use, but it would be a uh, even better document for other people to use and achieve your results. Better service, better pricing, better work environment for you and your staff, as well as higher, more secure earnings will result. So those who have joined us, thank you so very much. Thanks for joining us. We, we appreciate your, your company. Thank you for supporting uh, the form tool. We, um, it's taken us by surprise, um, the uses, uh, the imagination, uh, and the worldwide appetite for it, uh, we just appreciate it enormously. And we view a good part of our job is to, uh, is to learn from you. So, so thank you very much.